Hello, everyone. This is an unscripted video that I'm going to put together because I've been traveling on the road for quite a while, and I don't have my usual broadcasting setup with me, and it's been a while since I've made a video. So what I want to talk about is something that I run into quite frequently on design projects and when doing mill optimization. Engineers involved in mineral comminution have to grasp that there's basically three size classes that you need to consider when you're doing your comminution calculations and when you're setting up your laboratory test programs. So the coarsest size fraction goes by a bunch of different names. We can call it the crushing size class. We can call it the size class where impact happens. Just call it coarse. What's happening here, you're generally exploiting pre-existing fractures that exist in a rock. You're going to be looking at sizes on the range of 25 millimeters up to 100 millimeters, maybe even coarser. So anything that gets blasted, the coarsest chunks of what's in that pile of blasted rock, that's what's going to be affected by this mechanism of breakage. And then there's the medium-sized class. You can describe the breakage that happens here as attrition. And oftentimes, this size class is, is picking up what's going on in the texture of a rock. So if you have a brecciated rock, this breakage mechanism is probably going to be pulling apart those brecciated particles. What the texture of the rock is, is not necessarily related to the fractures that exist there. So uh, you have to have a distinct measurement in the size class above it, as well as this size class, and even below it, below it being the, the fine size class, and you can call this abrasion or you can call this grain breakage or, or grain disintegration or something like that. What you're trying to do at the finest size class is you're basically trying to pull the grains apart. You've already broken the matrix, and now you're trying to get at what's, what's in and on the grains. So three size classes. Each of these size classes is going to have its own laboratory test associated with it because it's not necessary that the rock is going to have consistent breakage characteristics across these three size classes because you're measuring three different mechanisms of breakage. So in the signaling.com software, the, the wiki that is associated with the software contains a table that describes some of the common models that are used out there in the industry. And a lot of the bond-based models use the three bond laboratory test to describe the three size classes. So you've got a, a crushing work index, and this crushing work index test goes by a whole bunch of other names. It can be the, the LEIT, the LEIT test, which is the low energy impact test. Um, all of these things are basically measuring a great big rock that gets hit by two pendulums, and you see how much energy the pendulums need to impart into the rock to break it. Of course, a size class. Medium size class. In the bond world, you use a rod mill work index test to describe this. And the rod mill work index is picking up the breakage characteristic, not necessarily of what a rod mill would do, but it's picking up the size class kind of from a millimeter up to 10 millimeters. So that's what you use a rod mill work index for when you're doing things like sag mill and HPGR designs. You're trying to pick up what is the ore hardness in that medium size range? And then all of the bond tests, um, all of the bond models will use a bond ball mill work index test to describe the finest size class. Now, all of the other uh, design methodologies and models that I've shown on this table also use more or less the bond um, apparatus in the case of the SMC test and the SAG design test, they modify it a little bit. So in the SMC test, you apply a different equation to the components that come out of the bond ball mill grindability test, and you compute a new metric that is appropriate for the SMC or for the, the, the Morel MI class models. And in the MRI class models, you don't use a, a tumbling test to come up with your coarse and medium sizes. You use an SMC test, which is an impact test. So SMC test, you actually 
I beg your pardon, the SMC test works with Morel MI models. The SAG design methodology uses a different medium size class test. It uses something called a SAG design mill, and it doesn't actually come with a coarse measurement. They just kind of extrapolate from what they see in the laboratory mill up to you know, any indefinite coarse size. In the uh, another package that exists out there you know, that comes from SGS, there's a model called SEAT2, which originated back in, in the Minivex days. And it has uh, it uses a ball mill work index. It can be a, a, a normal ball mill work index or a modified one. I won't describe what that means. It uses a SAG power index, an SPI value, and it doesn't have a direct um, energy component attached to the core size class, but it generates this thing called a CI value, a crushing index, and it's measured during the size preparation of the SPI feed, so it's effectively doing the job of seeing how susceptible to crushability that ore is. So the susceptibility to crushability is not the same thing as a crushing work index. In the model, it's actually used to adjust the slope of particle size distributions, but it kind of has the same effect. I'm going to treat it for the purposes of this discussion as a measurement of coarse particle breakage characteristics. Finally, a package a lot of people will be familiar with is JK SimMet. It doesn't have a coarse size measurement directly, but there are indirect ways of inferring it. What it uses is a, a pair of metrics that you measure that kind of manifest as the medium size class. I could do a whole video describing how you dissect these T10 by ECS charts. But So for your purposes, the A and the B value that come out of the test are averaged so that they're based on this medium size class. And the SMC test kind of leverages that, um, that median, that, that averaging, to, to avoid some of the complexities of the full drop weight test. And in the JK SimMet world, most of the operators I know use a bond ball mill work index and an energy model for the ball mills. It's not mandatory. There's other ways you can deal with it. There is also a measurement that is made in the full drop weight test, which is a tumbling test called a TA and that develops an abrasion component that goes into the JK SimMet model, which kind of does the job of measuring some of that fine particle breakage. So here is some data from the public grindability database, and these are two metrics that operate in that medium size class. I'm looking at the rod mill work index on the vertical axis and the A times B value that comes from both the SMC test and from the JK dropweight test. I have isolated one set of published data, so this is the Blackwater mine in, well, soon to be mine, in uh, British Columbia, Canada. And what it shows is a relatively nice relationship where the rod mill work index increases with decreasing A times B value, and you can see there's a nice kind of a, an inverse power relationship here. And that's exactly what we would expect to see for these two metrics. The rest of the cloud of data that you see here, these are all the other projects. So you can see where Blackwater fits very nicely in kind of the middle of the cloud, so it's not very noisy. It is skewed towards the hard end of the cloud, right? We're at the kind of the upper left of this diagram, which suggests this has got some hard ore in it. And the, the colors here indicate different labs. So the green lab and the orange lab generally agree on what the, the OR relationship is between these two um, metrics. So again, that's a quality control check. Both labs have come back with the same relationship in these two parameters. That's a check mark for me when I'm doing a quality control check. So here's a different set of data that was published. This comes from the Cadia mine in Australia. And you can see that the data here does not fit inside the cloud and the rod mill work index comes out substantially higher to what you would expect based on the A times B values. So there's a couple of possibilities here. The first possibility is just there's some sort of error in this data. There's an experimental problem in the laboratory. The apparatus has problems. 
um, maybe the, the samples that were tested were not actually the same sample. You might have had a, a bias in the subsampling where the rod mill saw harder uh, rocks than what went into the drop weight test. Now, I happen to know that the laboratories that are commonly used by uh, the Australian industry make use of an inappropriate apparatus to measure what they call a rod mill work index. Uh, without going into too many details, there is a specification for what a bond rod mill should look like. And among other things, it's got a wave liner on it. Not all, but most of the laboratories, the commercial laboratories in Australia, have an inappropriate rod mill apparatus, which means their data is not appropriate for this sort of an analysis. So for me, if I see this sort of data and then I identify that the rod mill results came from an Australian laboratory, I will mark that as a failure on a quality control check due to an inappropriate um, apparatus measuring the rod mill work index. And at that point, I throw out those rod mill work index data and I'll work exclusively with the A times B data when I'm doing my, my analysis. So here's another set of data. And again, this is published data from another Canadian mine, Bruce Jack, which is also in British Columbia. It's, it's quite some distance away from Blackwater. And if I cycle back and forth between these two, you can see that they both operate in a slightly different part of this cloud and that Bruce Jack is generally softer material. So that's, that's useful to know. But you can also see that they, each one of them kind of sits in its own particular part of the cloud. So again, this as a quality control check, is it reasonable to say that the, there's something wrong with this laboratory data? Maybe it's a drop weight test, maybe it's a rod mill work index. The answer is not necessarily because the Bruce Jack deposit could well fit well within this cloud, right? You're still within the cloud, just in a slightly different part of it because there will be rock characteristics that are treated differently to a tumbling test, which is what the rod mill work index test is to a drop weight test, which is what the A times B is generated from. So if there is a, a slight, if there's a texture that responds differently to the two tests, then it's valid to have slightly different results. Where I see this the most commonly is when you have bimodal characteristics within a rock, so SCARNs are, are terrible for this, and drop weight tests use individual specimens and depending which specimen gets pulled out of the tray and put into the apparatus, you'll get different results. Whereas with a rod mill work index test, all of the sample goes into a crusher when you're doing the feed preparation. All of the sample goes into a riffle splitter. Assuming the riffle splitter isn't biased, you're going to have valid samples all the way down your splitting until you get into the feed. So it's a lot easier to prepare a non-biased feed for the rod mill work index test than it is for the drop weight tests. The other thing that can happen, again, with these, these A times B tests, because you're dealing with individual specimens, you won't see any autogenous effects of a hard abrasive piece of material working on its adjacent softer piece of, of material all of the breakage is done just by impact, whereas in the tumbling test, these autogenous effects can appear. So because you're measuring slightly different mechanisms, you can expect a, a valid data set to kind of float around within this, this cloud of, uh, of background data. So that not all projects are gonna land precisely in the middle the way that Blackwater has appeared right in the middle of this cloud. So to close out, I'll just reiterate that the purpose of collecting the three different size classes and sending samples off to the laboratory to generate what, you know, to a project manager looks like redundant data. Why are we collecting three samples and shipping them independently to the lab? It's because the models of grindability that we use 
need a characterization at these three different size classes, and there are distinct tests that are used for particular models to, to describe the coarse, the medium, and the fine size breakage. At the beginning of a project, you can't take shortcuts here. You're going to have to collect these samples and get them tested. If you're going to use multiple models, which I would always recommend doing, you're going to need to collect a second sample of that medium size class or at the laboratory ask them to split that medium sample into two. That's usually a better idea. And then you're going to collect two tests in the medium size class. And commonly, like for my purposes, I want to see the rod mill work index all the time, and I want to see that on a machine with a wave liner. And then if it's a soft deposit, we'll probably go with an SPI or its generic equivalent, the SAG grindability index, the SGI. If it's a hard deposit, I'll probably want to go with the SMC test. If I know that there are other consultants on the job or if the engineering company is likely to be using uh, an SMC test-based model, so uh, for example, Asenko has a, an in-house model that uses the bond ball mill work index at the fine size. It uses the DWI from the SMC test to describe the medium size class. And among other things, they use the RQD, which is a geotechnical measurement, to describe the course size. So if I know that Osenko is working on this job or likely to work on the job, I'll make sure that we're collecting the SMC test so that they have data to use with their model, unless there's a reason not to use the SMC test, which then results in a 27-page memo that describes why it's not a good thing to use. So again, just to summarize, we've got three size classes, we've got a whole bunch of tests, some of which are redundant, but you still want to collect them to establish what the relationships are. Once you've gone through a program where you've established the relationships, you can then start to skip tests if relationships exist. Make sure that you do collect a few samples as you go along just to make sure that those relationships you established maintain over the, the rest of your body. But three size classes, three sets of tests, that'll keep your modelers happy, that will avoid surprises when you get into operation and you realize that the core stuff is a lot harder than you expect it is. 